morning, everybody, and welcome to Tales from the Heart, a podcast from the Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy Association. This morning, I am here joined by Dr. Harry Lever and longtime friend, and I'm going to tell him some things about that later on. Good morning, Dr. Lever. How are you today? Morning. All good in Ohio? Well, I don't know. <laughs> We've got lots of troubles in Ohio. Yeah, you've been making the news a lot lately. Yeah, we sure have. Springfield, mm. Ohio. Uh, you know, I read a really interesting article last night about Springfield, Ohio, and the story that led to so many Haitians deciding to make that their home. And it's really quite an inspiring story, I've got to be honest. Um, and it's not what most people think it is. So I encourage you to go learn the history of Springfield, Ohio, and how they have gone through a very interesting growth cycle and are still in it. And our best wishes to the people of Springfield. We wish them nothing but health and happiness. You and I have spent a lot of years approaching 28 of them in this space, providing insight, guiding research, helping patients find care, and you've been providing them with excellent care as have your colleagues over at the Cleveland Clinic and throughout our HCMA recognized network. Um, we've done some amazing things. But I'm gonna tell you what I have found and what will soon be available, at least in snippets. I found the video of the very first time we all met in New Orleans and I have had it transferred to digital and mm -hmm. I will be getting access to that in the next couple of days. I'm we a went to a restaurant, didn't we? We went to a horrible restaurant. Out, it was out, out <laughs> in the sticks. It was out in the sticks. History lesson for those interested and how things normally work in our space. We typically invite physicians or members of industry or whatever to, to get to know you and you buy them dinner or you help host an event and they come. Well, I didn't have any money and I didn't have any infrastructure. And I said, I'll make the reservations. You guys are all paying for yourself, but please come. And you and Barry and Cricket Sidemen. Right. Cricket Bill was McKenna there. was there. Was Bill McKenna Ooh. there? I'm not sure if he was there or not. I think Mark Sherrod was there. There was this core of these early right. HCM think tank type people. And Chuck Morrell, shout out to Holly Morrell, his daughter, he brought the video camera. We set up a video and it was like a handheld video camera in 1996 or seven. So mm -hmm. it was teen 96, end of 96. End November, of 96. Like it was November, November the 5th or 6th or something like that. So we have the video and I will soon be putting clips together of the history of the HCMA told in video, and you're going to see some of your favorite docs and yours truly with very different hairstyles and colors. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a long, long time ago. Yeah. So as we enter septal reduction September, or as we're in it, and I think back of the history that you and I share with understanding the role of myectomy and how important it was early on, and then how dual chamber pacing came in and went away and alcohol ablation came in and took its proper place right. and now we're dealing with myosin inhibitors so for those with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with obstruction it's a really interesting time to be looking at your treatment right. options but we're going to look a little bit at the history today and then we're going to talk about some other things towards the end here so harry do you believe that there are certain anatomies that lend itself better to being really helpful for myectomy and for some nearly curing their symptoms. I don't want to use the cure word, but what have you seen in patients who've had well, myectomies? It, it, it all has to do with, you know, how thick the septum is, where the septal thickness is. If you have proximal septal hypertrophy, a myectomy will work well. We've also learned that things like apical hokum, you, that doesn't work very well, but we've also come to learn that the mitral valve is very important. And there are some patients who have outflow tract obstruction because of redundant mitral valves, and the septum may not be that thick. So you have to, you know, you got to look at everything. You got to look at everything. Where's the hypertrophy? What's the mitral valve look like? Sometimes you got to, you have a redundant mitral valve and you got a thickened septum. And sometimes you got to, it just matters you know, where every, how the anatomy sits. And it makes a difference how you approach the surgery. And it also, in terms of alcohol septal ablation, we've 
kind of save that for older people who might have increased risk for surgery, but most of those would need to have just proximal septal hypertrophy. If you have a problem with the mitral valve and proximal septal hypertrophy, the, the alcohol probably won't work. So knowing your anatomy, critically important, and something we didn't talk about back then, but now we're understanding may have a more important role, even in choosing myectomy, alcohol ablation, myosin inhibitors, is genetics. Right. So this week we held a webinar about amyloidosis, which is a very different disease state than hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but on imaging can look almost the same or can look the same to the average interpreter of that particular image. I listened to that presentation and I was, I guess, a bit surprised that it's, it's not common, but it certainly does occur. Doing genetics and things like that are very important, more important than I ever thought when, when you have t two possibilities working together. We have to really define things before you really go in you know, full tilt and decide, well, I'm just going to operate on this patient because he's got a thick heart. But you know, you got to want to make sure, because now there is some treatment for amyloid also. You need to know about that. And I think that genetic studies, assuming insurance companies will pay, it's really important in deciding what you're going to do with a patient. I think that, yeah, that was quite a presentation. Thank you. I, I thought our presenters did a great job. It was a very high level med tech talk. Like it was not for layman, definitely. We got it very, but we got into some weeds there. But knowing the difference between amyloid and HCM, yes, you could have amyloid and need a myectomy because you have that flow tract obstruction right. that's not going to be resolved. Right. But then you need a different therapy after. Right. So I think we've actually gotten to the point that we can very clearly state that genetic testing isn't a convenience or it's not just an interesting data point, right. but it is a clinically important marker to determine what care is necessary or appropriate for any given patient. I would encourage everybody, if you haven't done your genetic testing yet, we want to do it. So why do we want to do it? If we're talking about septal reduction in September, why am I talking about genetics? If you have a gene for amyloidosis, for Fabry's, for arasopathy even, you may also have obstruction, but you may have a different treatment after surgical intervention. Alcohol isn't necessarily great for those hearts, so you don't wanna do an alcohol septal ablation. You're looking at myectomy and then additional treatment. And I think it's really important that we bring in genetics into the conversation of how to manage obstruction. So for those who have garden variety HCM or no genetic mutation identified. So we know they're not an amyloid based on what we know about the amyloid genes. We know they're not rasopathy. We know they're not Fabry's. We know they're not Dannon but we don't know which other kind of HCM they are. We kind of handle the gene positives and the no gene identified similarly when it comes to managing obstruction and then the aftercare. Harry, how far do you feel like we've come since 1996? Very far. It's, it's incredible. Um, and uh, I mean, some things have gotten complicated and uh, uh, we didn't worry too much about, I mean, we had beta blockers at that time and we didn't worry too much about what we were using because most of them seemed to work. But now we got a new, a new problem with stuff coming in from overseas and uh, some of it isn't working just because it's made badly. So now we got to worry about that, which we didn't really worry about early on. But it's, having said all that early on, we didn't really have a lot of studies. We just kind of came across the fact that beta blockers and calcium channel blockers, you know, they kind of work and we'd use them. And, but, and as a matter of fact, there still haven't been large randomized controlled trials on beta blockers and calcium channel blockers. And there's been, there have been but some- But wait, there is one going on right now. I understand, but I'm saying, but I'm saying- Back then, yeah. You know, back then. and. And then we, you know, then we came across uh, disapyramide and so, so that had some wor wor working, but there's side effects with that drug. And, you know, and we were just sort of fiddling around trying to do whatever we could to make people feel better. Things have changed a bit. And, you know, and there are probably some people now that, that 
uh, may, maybe there were people back then. If we had the the newer drugs, we wouldn't have operated on them. So it's it's it all it all changes. It all comes together. Yeah. It, it, it ebbs, it flows, it changes, right. and again, we can go back to 96 and I actually had the dual chamber pacemaker in 1996. Um, that was my therapy when I met you all. And then it was, does this thing even work as explained? Will a dual chamber pacer reduce obstruction? And we found that for a very tiny population, maybe that does work. Yeah, is it the right first step therapy? I don't think hooking yourself up with batteries and wires is a good first no. step therapy. No. But for those who have a device, it could be turned on and it might help you a little bit. And that's one therapy. Then we have our, our surgical intervention that's been around since the 60s, 50s, 60s, 63, something like that, created by Dr. Morrow, who is also a patient with HCM, which I always find fascinating and I bring it up whenever I can. And shout out to the entire Morrow family, who I know actually follows this podcast. And I hope to have them on here someday to talk to them about their dad and the, the contributions he made to this field. We've got the Morrows and we've got the Germans in the 80s come up with this, or eight, late, early 90s, I guess it was. Early, it was in the 90s. It was in the 90s. I'm off that decade where the alcohol ablation concept came forward based on an article written by Barry of a patient who had a random infarct in the septal region. And after the naturally occurring MI heart attack, the patient's obstruction disappeared because the heart attack was placed in just the right spot. So I may have had therapeutic endocarditis in some ways. This gentleman had a therapeutic MI right. and opened our eyes to the possibility that altering heart muscle might change flow and interesting concept, but patients don't typically like to have more scar added to their heart. And for younger patients, that can prove problematic over time. So then we enter the generation of myosin inhibitors, really. Right. There was a gap where there was nothing new coming, but then we have myosin inhibitors. And we've got one on market, one coming to the FDA's attention shortly. And then the next generation past that is being developed and it's just out of a phase one trial right now. Did you ever think you'd see so much interest from pharma on little old HCM? <laughs> I didn't. Well, no. Mm -mm. I don't know why I didn't see it coming. We've been cultivating for it for 20 years and making sure we had silos for patients to get good care and also get opportunities for clinical trials like Cleveland Clinic and our friends and all of our HCMA recognized centers of excellence. So we kind of dreamed that they would come and they're here now. And I feel like the cruise ships have shown up and Everybody's coming onto our little island trying to understand us. And uh, I think it's important for the entire ecosystem to understand how we can best work together to achieve our ultimate goals. The next topic that we're going to jump into is the That's issue right. of Topro clinical trials. So interesting thing, I don't know if you've even seen this one yet, out of ESC, one of the CYTO trials, which is a head-to-head -head I'm sorry, guys, I forget which tree it is, but it's a tree from Saito. I'll remember it in a minute or Ross will help me with it. They looked at the use of beta blockers with Afficampton, and then they pulled the beta blocker from half of the population and nobody changed their peak VO2. Nobody changed any of their markers. They didn't have a decline in capacity. In fact, maybe some of them felt a little bit better. There, there was no statistically significant change removing a beta blocker once you're treated with a myosin inhibitor, which is super interesting that maybe we aren't as reliant, we don't need them as much, or maybe we do, maybe some people will turn out to have a, a deeper need for a beta blocker. But it's looking like the myosin inhibitors are doing as well, if not better, than beta blocker therapy. So we'll know more data soon, but it looks promising. You and I have talked for a long time about which beta blocker, which manufacturer, where did it come from? And we were trying to arrange for this to happen today, but he was too busy. You and I are gonna be joined in this podcast by a dear friend of both of ours, David Light. You wanna talk a little bit about who David is and what he does, Harry? Yeah, he, uh, it's very interesting how I met him. He was written up in an article in Bloomberg News and at the same time, I was written up in another article in Bloomberg News about a patient that I had had who 
had hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. He was uh, really a sick guy, had lung disease, kidney, uh, kidney disease, and we operated on him, got him through the surgery, and all of a sudden, about three years later, went into heart failure. And uh, we got rid of the fluid, and and then three days after discharge, he was back in heart failure. And I had known a we recognized that they had changed his diuretic on him and that's why the heart failure happened and i had been in touch with uh, somebody at bloomberg news and that that's how i got in there into an article and at the same time david light was in another article and it said that he was testing drugs i said oh my god i really need to meet this guy Uh, i need to know about we got to really get drugs tested i looked him up found he was at this company, Valisher, which he ran, got his phone number and called him. And ever since January of 19, you know, right before the pandemic got going, we became good friends. We talk all the time and he's doing all kind of testing for the Defense Department and as well as some other laboratories are. But it's very important now that we test drugs. Food is tested. Let's talk about what testing actually means and We're going to have David here to kind of go through some of these steps in the next couple of weeks. I'm not sure when we're going to be able to snag him. It's probably not going to be a Friday, so it's going to be a different day. So stay tuned for the announcement of when we're going to get him on. What he does, it's a system of evaluating not only the active ingredient within the drug, but also something called the dissolution rate, which to get really tedious with some regulatory language, when the Generic Drug Act was passed, sustained release mechanisms in drugs really weren't a thing yet. So that's where things get really complicated. How quickly does your drug dissolve in your system? And how much time do you have it on board if you take it at eight in the morning? Is there anything left at five in the afternoon if it's in every 12 hour dose? Or have you depleted all the drug by then? And what you and I have seen, Harry, is that some people will say, I just don't feel right on this drug. It's something has changed. And then we're finding out through research that David has done that those particular manufacturers dissolve too quickly. So you're left with nothing on board, as we call it. And that could be very dangerous with some drugs. A beta blocker could be one because all of a sudden your heart rate's not suppressed and you can pop into an arrhythmia or you can feel more symptomatic. And the other drug that's been problematic is tacrolimus, which is used for transplant patients. And we need to make sure that our immune systems are staying in check at all time. And that's what the tech does. So it doesn't, our organs don't get attacked by our body. And we know that back in 2017, there were a lot of very scary things going on within the transplant community, including one of our very own discussion group leaders ended up needing a second heart transplant because her tacrolimus just was not working and they didn't know. And you know some cases out at the Cleveland Clinic where patients got into a lot of trouble and they're like, oh, maybe there's a problem. The FDA currently doesn't have a mechanism in place or a funding source that they can require these manufacturers who are mostly coming from overseas to evaluate. So what David has done is he's come into his own independent lab and he's investigating the drugs. Every batch he buys, he tests, make sure that it's within tolerance and he's grading them red, yellow, green. Green, everything's fine. Yellow, they're not perfect, but they're still within compliance kind of maybe. And then red is they're bad. And it turns out that there are some very good generic drugs that are very high quality and very low price coming from places like India and Turkey and China. But there's also some really horrible ones that aren't anything that you think you're getting. And there was just an article written in a scientific journal called STAT, where they the article was about the fact that there was a testing laboratory in India that falsified the data on 400 drugs, and we don't know which ones they are. So we're gonna, people are trying to figure out what's going on. So you gotta be very careful about what you're taking and, and you have to be aware that if something doesn't seem right, you know, like your blood pressure suddenly goes up. You got to watch and make sure that they haven't changed the manufacturer on you in the drugstore. So I always tell people nowadays, if you don't take the drugs out of the store till you look at them and make sure they're the same thing as that you've been taking, because we've seen patients who have had control of their blood pressure, all of a sudden they come in and the blood pressure is not under control 
And we looked and we found that the manufacturer had been changed. So you've got to be careful about that. And everything has to, you know, I think we're going to have to get to the point that every batch of drugs that is sold is going to need to be tested. So we make sure that it's okay. And I will say, as somebody who tries to be optimistic, even in pessimistic situations, this is an opportunity for these bad generic manufacturers to become good generic manufacturers. Right. We'll let them know that there's a problem and they have the opportunity to fix it or get out of the market. Right. We're not going to buy dangerous or low-dosed or high-dosed medication. We need to trust what's in the bottle. Right. And the way we're going to do that is talking about it and finding ways to change. The current regulatory system isn't working for no. us in this space. No. We need a change. It no. is recognized that the Department of Defense said, hey, this is a problem. And that's what we're going to talk about in the next podcast with David. Maybe not the next podcast, but an upcoming podcast with David about how the DOD came in and said we want to do something and how there is a bill in front of the Senate right now to do the same thing for the VA. And if our Department of Defense and our Veterans Administration, they're doing the research to find the quality issues, then great, let's take their learnings and bring it to all Americans. And let's do it in a constructive way. Let's find solutions to the problem. I think enough of us are aware of it now. And we did a survey, I dropped the link below. I'm still looking for another about 100 people to take our survey. So. We have 813 respondents right now. I'd like to get to 1,000. We did an update on our PFDD survey, so the patient-focused drug development meeting that we held in 2020. We thought it's been four years. We've got some new drugs on market, and things are changing a little bit. What do y'all think today? But I added a question in that survey, and that question was about the generic drug quality issue to see what the community is thinking, the HCM patient community is thinking about this issue. I explained the, the Department of Defense pilot study, and I link to some of those items, as well as the podcast that Dr. Lever and I did with Catherine Ebon, uh, author of Bottle of Lies. And I, we asked the question, you know, how concerned are you about generic drug quality in the USA? And 39% of you said you're very concerned. And I think that tells me everything that I need to know about how much energy we're going to put into this particular issue. But let's take a look down the other options that you had to answer. I am somewhat concerned about drug quality, 23%. I am moderately concerned, 10%. I am not concerned at all, 9.7%. I have not thought about it, but would like to learn more is at about 10 10.5%. And then 6% live out of the U.S. 39%, 39.26% out of 800 total respondents, 84 completed, 134 skipped this question, and 680 people answered this question. So out of 680 random people questioned, roughly 40% are very concerned about drug quality. And they're what I would call pretty educated on it because they've listened to this and they've looked at some of the data and maybe they've read the book. It's important, and it's going to be an important policy issue that HCMA starts to follow more closely. And as we approach our next visit to Capitol Hill in February, we're evaluating whether or not, or how we're going to be addressing this problem publicly. So it's dry topic, I know, but it's important. It's important, it affects all of us. So. Dr. Lever, we've been talking about this problem since about 2007, eight, if I, if I could remember back that far. Are you happy to see that there's some attention being spent here now? And that but we, we, it has to be done. And we're going to have to really change. The rules are going to have to change. And everything is, is going to need to be, uh, every batch is going to have to be tested before people swallow it. That basically happens with food. And you have to do it with drugs. I mean, here we are trying to treat people that don't feel well, and you can't guarantee to them that the drug they're going to get is going to work. And that that's a problem. There's a disconnect. We all want to be able to trust data about how drugs work. And I have attended a meeting every December in Washington for maybe the past four years or so, three, three four years. 
It's called the Cardiovascular Clinical Trialists Meeting. It is all the thought leaders in cardiovascular research. And the first time I went, I just sat and I listened. And they're all perplexed that why is it that the study results never really play out in real life? And I, I listened and they were talking about statins and they were talking about how they're just not seeing the same results in, in their patients and they're prescribing it this much and that. And then they were using crossing between brand names and generic names. And I said, well, what are we talking about? Are we talking about the generics or are we talking about the name brand? And do you think it's really appropriate to compare generic to name brand? And like, well, they're the same. I'm like, no, they're not. Yeah. And they were so shocked about the issues related to time release mechanisms. They hadn't stopped and thought about that. They thought somebody else had addressed those problems. They thought it was all equal. And it's not all equal. And they went, oh. And then the next year I came back and other people were in the room and I brought it up again. And they're like, you know, we've been doing some different things. We've been using name brand only dispense as written on our scripts. And I said, that's a good idea. I said, are you seeing a difference in the outcomes? And they're like, I think we are. So I'm going back this December and I'm going to see if there's been some updates there as well. But we need more people in on the problem and the solution. And I think it's really important to keep talking about this. And I, I can't wait to have David here to talk about the problem much more specifically and share with you some data on what he found in tacrolimus, uh, fluorosamide, and metropolol. So we're going to keep talking about this issue as we move forward. I really have bad hiccups right now. <sighs> there you go. Spasming diaphragm. Thank you. Okay. So, Harry. I want to talk, I'm going to go back for a minute to myectomies. I want to talk about how beneficial you have seen the procedure be over the years. And while people are now looking at options with having more drug options up front, what do you think should be the, the path for people to try the medications, see if it deals with the obstruction? And then should that be destination or should they think, well, if I get rid of my obstruction through surgery, maybe I don't have to be on the meds as long. I don't know that that's true or not, but these are things that people are asking me about. Like, what do I do first? I think we still need some more information to, to decide that. And I, I think that uh, we probably st I have started doing a few less surgeries than we've done. But, you know, I think it, it's still kind of new. The drugs are still kind of new. And I think we're just going to have to sort of, we need a little more time to have a little more feeling about what's what. I mean, certainly yeah. surgery done in the right place by the right surgeon, you get good results. But, you know, if you have to have general anesthesia and something can always happen, it's all, maybe if you can do it non-invasively in terms of, a, of medicine, Maybe that's okay too, but I think we're 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 kind of the drugs are certainly looking hopeful. In these individuals who are looking at their options, meds first. Speak with a high volume surgeon. Make your decisions, and then I do want to take a moment to talk about people who don't have great outcomes from from myectomy. Either they're not getting their gradient resolved typically because they've gone to a lower volume center, but even the best docs can leave a gradient sometimes. It's an art form going in there to do those cuts. But what about some of the downstream consequences, whether it's a myectomy, a bypass, et cetera. Some people have longer term complications from surgery. And I don't always think that we have great answers for them. How have you dealt with those patients in the past? In the past, we didn't have these other new drugs. And I, so we use combination of beta blockers and calcium channel blockers, you know, cardizam CD and, and, and metoprolol, or and in some patients we've used disapyramide, you know, if, if necessary, but that has side effects too, particularly in men with the prostate. So it just, when you run into a problem, you, you try, to try to figure out what you can do for the patient that's having the problem. That's what happens in healthcare. You know, everything isn't perfect. Nothing, nothing in life is perfect. Exactly. It, and you just try to do the best you can. I want to bring up something a bit specific, but without any, any names or, or institutions. And I've seen it a couple of times over the years, and I know somebody's struggling with this right now. 
and that is chronic pain after a myectomy. So much so that we're being treated with drugs in the classification of, you know, like gabapentin and other pain medications long term. What would your advice be to somebody who's got long term pain? We're not dealing with the cardiac issue any longer. We're dealing with the rest of the body. And the pain is so intense that they're on very strong pain medications for the rest of their lives, potentially. Are there other strategies that might be useful? Well, there are people who specialize in treating pain. And I see somebody like that. But even then, even with pain, what we think is good drugs with pain therapy, you got to be careful that what you're taking is really something that's working. It may be the medicine you're taking to relieve the pain isn't working. And, you know, you just, you, you got to be careful about that. But again, there are people who specialize in treating pain. And I think that that would be something to look at. Fantastic. Okay. And for those of you who haven't gotten to your optimal health yet, I cannot state enough or more frequently how important it is to check in with a high volume center of excellence. There are what I would call mid-range programs in a lot of different areas now. But if you're struggling and you're not getting the answers at a mid-range program, not the top surgical programs, and there's about five or six that I would put in that classification that are 50 plus myectomies a year or better, go to one of those programs. If you have financial difficulty getting there, the Lori Fund can provide up to $600, which is typically enough for a plane ticket and a night in a hotel in these cities. So if we can get you to a center for a deeper evaluation, we are more than happy to assist you with those types of, of issues. And we have had some really amazing philanthropy in the space of the Lori Fund, and we have already given out 15 scholarships, and we have many more to give out. If you financially qualify, we'll help you, and we have some new partners that might even be able to provide some additional financial support for some families. So if you are struggling financially, please reach out to the HCMA. I can't guarantee we can fix it all, but we might be able to make it a little easier on you. So again, that's for the Lori Fund. Harry, I have some good news. And I kind of talked about it last night on my personal Facebook page, and I meant to do it on the HCMA page, but I want to share some good news. And I want to acknowledge the individual who inspired me to get really focused on this particular project. And I'm going to tell a story, and it has nothing to do with septal reduction September. In August of 2020, a young man named Derek Armstead passed away in Norfolk, Virginia. I might get some of the details wrong. I'm sure his family will excuse me. I believe he was 29 years old. I know he wasn't quite yet 30. He was a new dad to an infant son. He was goofing around with his nieces and nephews on a, on a weekend, and he passed out. And he was taken to the emergency room. Now, Derek is an African-American man, large. I don't know how tall he was. He's got to be over six foot by the pictures I've seen. Big, big guy, handsome man. And by the time he got to the emergency room, he had been resuscitated spontaneously. And they didn't ask him about his family heart health history. If they had, they would have learned that his mother had died before the age of 30. And she was on some kind of heart list at that time. He was only a child. He was a very tiny child when his mother died. And his sister was, wasn't over 10 years old, so they don't have a lot of memory. So Derek was released from the hospital and told to go check on neurology, that maybe he had some type of a seizure. And as you all know, getting a doctor's appointment can be crazy, but by the luck of whatever, he got to a neurologist on Tuesday who had cleared him and said, that's not epilepsy, that's not, you're, you don't have a seizure. I don't know what that was, but it wasn't your brain. Two days later, he was driving home and thought he'd go pick up some dinner, but he had his kid in the car and decided he would stop at home and drop his son off. He picked his car seat up out of the car, walked up the stairs into their apartment, got to the top of the stairs and dropped dead. Mm. He had a cardiac arrest. And he should have been in the hospital. That first event, he, they should have figured out what was going on with him and they let him go. Mm. Now, I have a lot of missions in my life. A lot of things we're trying to solve, a lot of problems we're trying to solve. But I can't help but wonder out loud, what if Derek was a white man? 
at 28, 29 years old who had passed out while playing. Would they have looked deeper? Would they have given it more attention? Would they have asked about his family history? Or would they would have discharged that person too because they were young? Is it a young thing? Because he was young and he showed up like this and they let him go. So was it his age? Was it his ethnicity? Was it his gender? I don't know exactly why Derek was ignored, but it made me mad. And when I get mad, I build projects. So we started a concept called the All Hearts Collaborative, that all hearts matter, and we want to take care of all the hearts. That's what I want to do with the rest of my life. I want to make sure all these hearts get taken care of. So we started to create a program that was going to be um, a little bit larger originally, and now it's going to be a little bit smaller. Uh, but it's going to be a pilot program, and we're going to be working in the South Ward of Newark, New Jersey, within the faith community to go into the churches, the synagogues, the temples, the, oh God, Muslim temples, I guess. I'm, not, I'm sorry if I'm not getting all of my, my, my religious houses named properly, um, but we're going to go out into the community as a whole pharmacies, community health centers, working with the local cardiologist. And we are going to talk about family heart health history in the community. And we're partnering with MPAC, which is a social justice religious organization, and nurse, uh, the PCNA, Preventative Cardiovascular Nurses Association, and our good friends there to create this program called the All Hearts Collaborative. And on Tuesday, we were notified that we will be receiving the funding that we were needing to make this a reality. Um, so thank you to our partners at New Jersey Health Foundation for believing in us. This will be our first community outreach program of this type. And we are going to hopefully get into this community and help people understand why heart health history is important and provide specific education on HCM, amyloidosis, and uncontrolled hypertension. And we've got the money committed from New Jersey Health Foundation as well as partners from Cytokinetics, Bridge Bio, Pfizer, and somebody else. It'll all be on the website and in the announcements, and the press release will be out in the next couple of days. We officially start the project on October 1st, and it is our first big push to really make a difference in health equity and diagnosis. So we're building a new kind of a thing, Harry. What do you think? Well, I think that's a good idea. We're glad the funders thought so too. <laughs> it all comes from an inspiration point, and it's not as if there hasn't haven't been other individuals from the African American Black community that have been delayed in diagnosis or have been lost. We know that when we're dealing with the loss of a young athlete it is most often a black male who will die from HCM undiagnosed. So we must change this. We must start talking about it in all communities, people of all colors. I'm also really excited that we've been doing a little bit more work with the organization ABC, which is the Association of Black Cardiologists, our good friend down in Marietta, Georgia, who you're gonna be hearing a lot about soon too, at Wellstar. She is a rising star in the field of HCM and amyloid and happens to be a very educated and wonderful black woman. So we're bringing diversity into our care model because if people see themselves and those who are treating them, they're more likely to go for care. So we have made a focused attempt to ask about the ethnic breakdowns of the staff of every program now. So we're making sure it meets the blended needs of the community and all people are heard and not ignored. Jimmy's commenting right now. So it was dismissed after passing out at 20. Doctor said a bleeding ulcer. Dr. Levers looked at my records. It was not a bleeding ulcer. We know that there's a lot of misdiagnosis out there. We know that the ecosystem isn't perfect, but we're trying to make it a little bit better. Keep talking about this. We lay down the tracks, we put down the engine on the train and we've hooked the wheels to the train and now we got to get the train moving. Once we do that and we can prove some success, we hope to bring this program to communities throughout the country. So yay, we did a thing. Now we get to do the work. Next thing, next weekend for the medical community that's going to be attending HSFA, we also have the HCM Society meeting and HSFA that are gonna take place in Atlanta. Also simultaneously, HCMA will be presenting in Orlando at the American Academy of Pediatrics 
trying to go out into a new space to talk to the pediatric community about our legislative initiatives to ask family heart health history questions in all well child examinations. So we'll be in two conferences next weekend, busy, busy weekend for HCMA. And at the end of October is the International Summit in Boston, as well as the patient meeting, which will be on Sunday, October 27th. If you've not signed up already, please do so. The room block is going to be closed in about a week. So if you think you want to join us, please do. We do know that this particular hotel is a little bit expensive. I'm sorry, but that's where the summit was. And we just kind of jumped on top of that. But there are some less expensive hotels right outside of town if you wanted to drive in. So you can stay right out of town and it's a little bit cheaper. If you need any help, we'll be happy to help you in the office. Give us a call. So Harry, it's 2024 and it's HCM. We've come a long way. We've got a long way to go. We've got some problems to solve with our drug quality. But I think we are finally getting some focus on how to address these problems. We've got the right partners. And now it's our time to bring it to the top level of our ecosystem in terms of policy, which is Washington, D.C. We're hoping to be back on the ground this February with another Hill Day. If you're interested in joining us for that, stay tuned for announcements of how you can get involved. But I think it's time that we really demand the change that we as patients need. This isn't political, it's policy. It's bipartisan. It's, we all have hearts. We all want equitable care. And we all wanna know what, what's in the pills that we're putting into our body. I think that's critically important, and I'm really happy that we're finally getting some, some mechanisms in which we can make a difference. The Senate bill to do the VA program is a really good start. It has nothing to do with us individually. It's just a really good policy to find out what, we're, what drugs we're giving our veterans. I think that's important. What do you think, Harry? Are we in a good place? Uh, yeah, I think it's extraordinarily important. I've been living with this problem for quite some time and uh, recognizing that there are problems and it's got to be fixed. We cannot continue doing what we're doing. And whether uh, part of this is going to have to be restructuring of the FDA or something, it, but it all has to be, it all has to be worked out in such a way that we know that what we're swallowing works. That's, that, that shouldn't, you know, that, that should be obvious to lots of people. You know, when you see that there are problems. I think we have, by virtue of being Americans, we tend to fist pound a lot and want to want to change things. We're we're a change society until we get into our infrastructure, and we're like, ah, no, the FDA is the FDA. It runs the way it runs, and they can't change it. It's just the FDA. I don't believe that. Mm-hmm. I believe when there's common sense change that should happen because the world is changing around us. We can make those changes. They don't have to be contentious and all political. No. We should give the people the space to do the work that needs to be done. Food and Drug Administration. How the hell is anybody supposed to organize those two massive things in our lives? Everybody eats and a lot of us take drugs. So maybe it needs to be split. Maybe food needs to be handled one way and drugs and vitamins and supplements and the things that aren't regulated now, maybe they should be. Don't know, just throwing some ideas out there. But I think it's a lot to ask of the FDA. They're not perfect. They're humans working in a system with regulatory guardrails that makes it sometimes difficult for them to be as nimble as we want them to be. So we have to ask them for change and we have to give them the grace while they make those changes and they're not gonna be perfect. I'm a realist. We're not just gonna change it by yelling. We can look at where we can come to some common ground and find some change. That's what I think we need to do. So on that note, it is the end of another edition of Tales from the Heart. And we're hoping to see a lot of you on the road over the next month or so. Lots going on. Don't lose touch with us over the next couple of weeks. We have a question coming in real quick before we wrap up. Lori Petrie, is there any way for patients to be managed and informed on brand safety? You want to talk a little bit about that, Harry? Well, I think it's going to, I think hopefully within the next few months, once we get more results from the Defense Department study, we'll have some idea and know clearly which ones are red and not working 
and uh, which ones are green and, you know, that, that are okay. Uh, but I think that this is a pilot study and we're going to have to get to a lot, lot more drugs than the 40 that's on the list. And we, you know, it's going to take time, but I think that we, we, uh, we need to, you know, it has to be done. And, and, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, and what we're going to also have to do is figure out a way to try to make more drugs in this country. There's also another problem we didn't talk about is when you ship drugs, you have to have the right environment. Like it can't be too hot. Drugs get damaged if when they're being shipped, that there's a, there can be a problem. And uh, that, that clearly has to be looked at. And that's going to, you know, uh, you know, you, you, you know, when it comes on a ship and then it comes to this country and then put on a truck and there's not been enough work done on that. Although there, there are people that have clearly been worried about that problem and we need to, we need to do something about that. The temperature issue is something that came to my attention what was about a year, year and a half ago when that woman from Texas reached out about the hot tacrolimus in her mailbox because it was liquid and her child who had had a liver transplant needed it. And it was hot to the touch and almost boiling in her mailbox on a 120 degree day in South Texas with a metal mailbox, which meant it was probably 140 or 160. You could have baked eggs in there like you could have cooked. And it was too hot. And when tacrolimus keeps getting heated up, it can actually intensify its response which could then cause, if you're overdosed on tacrolimus, it can cause kidney failure. All bad for a baby to get that kind of medication. I started to take a deep dive into that and find out that the average temperature in the back of some of the UPS vehicles, I think it was, was 130 or 140 degrees. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was not in the deep south. In the deep south, it was worse. So when you have these drugs that are being transferred in these high temperatures, this is a problem. If they were already in the pharmacy and the pharmacy lost its air conditioning and the temperature stayed above a certain point for a certain amount of time, they would have to destroy those drugs. But we don't seem to think about that when they're in transit. Right. And then you'll say, well, maybe they're only in transit for three hours or four hours. Mm -hmm. Have you been stuck on the tarmac out there lately? There's a lot of things that just sit out on tarmacs for hours and hours and hours. And then you're flying and then you're going to another tarmac. So what happens with these fluctuations in heat? I don't think we're paying enough attention no, to it. No, absolutely not. And it's going to it's gonna cost money, but they're going to have to figure out ways to do better shipping of this kind of stuff. That That's a huge problem that must be fixed. I'm not quite sure how we're going to get there, but I know we need to do it. That's right. We definitely need to do it. All right, Lori, that was a really great question. Jimmy, um, all your medications you're saying are from overseas. That might be fine. The data shows that there's a lot of good generic manufacturers overseas. I don't want to turn this into, you know, our country versus theirs. Within India, there are really good manufacturers doing good work, and we appreciate them. And in Turkey, there are some. And in China, there are some. But there are bad actors in all. And the bad actors need to be pulled out. They have to be given an opportunity to take corrective action. And if they can't, they can't sell their drugs to Americans. I literally just broke my pen as I said that. This is how, how passionate I am about this. I broke a pen. But we need, to, we need to make sure that our patients, our clients, our family members, ourselves are getting drugs that are safe. And I think that one thing to realize is, or a couple of things to realize, is if you suddenly don't feel well, you know, we got it. one thing can be that you got sicker or they changed the medicine on you. And I think you got to look at it from that point of view. You got to look and see: has the medicine been changed? Does it? Is it? Did they change the manufacturer? Because that that's an that's a possible thing that could have happened. But also, you could be feeling worse. So you, that's why it, it, all these factors have to be looked at. I got a phone call a couple, or a, I don't know if it was a phone call or a, a message of some sort, because they come from all kinds of places now, from a longtime patient member, and she said something's different. I said, did you refill your meds lately? She said, actually, yeah, last week. I said, when did you start feeling bad? Last week. I said, check your manufacturer. I got a note back a couple days later. Bingo. That was the problem. So don't panic if you're not feeling well. Stop and think. What has changed? 
talk to your team and off we go on the next adventure. So we encourage you to join us next time on Tales from the Heart. I will not be here next Friday. I will be in Atlanta attending two meetings simultaneously and getting ready to go to the third. So uh, we might pop in from the road, check us out on Facebook and LinkedIn if we're going to do that. If you're going to be at HSFA, we're on the exhibit floor, stop by and see us. If you're in Orlando, if you're a pedi pediatric cardiologist, you're a pediatrician, we're gonna be at AAP. We're kind of in the back of the floor. You go to photos and the puppies. Go see the photos and the puppies so you can get your picture taken, new headshots. Harry, thank you so much for joining us again on Tales from the Heart. Ross, thanks for handling things backstage and dropping links. And to all of our sponsors, thank you very much. And to all of the team here at the HCMA who helped in every way possible every day, but those of you who were working on the All Hearts Collaborative grant process, thank you, thank you, thank you. It's the first large grant we've gotten from a foundation for a project like this. So it's a big milestone for us as an organization and I'm super proud of the entire team for pulling together and articulating our dreams so much so that we got funded. Kind of like, feels like you win a mini lottery. And it's kind of funny in the nonprofit world. Yay, they gave us money, so now we can do work that's really hard. <laughs> so that's where we are, to go off to do the work that's really hard. Thank you all, have a great weekend. And Harry, again, thank you. You're welcome. The Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy Association thanks the following sponsors for today's podcast. Psyokinetics, Bristol Myers Squibb, Biomarin, Tanaya Therapeutics, Viz AI and Al Nylum.